Um, I, before we start, I just want to mention that next next week we'll have another uh, another view, actually, of the pandemic from Dr. Sarah Gary, who is an epidemiologist and is a chief of medical education and communication for Los Angeles County. Uh, she lives in Portland, right right across the street from Greg Neal from the Neals, uh, <laughs> and she'll be talking about her perspectives on on the pandemic. Um, we'll, towards the end of Elsa's talk, um, there will be a discussion period, and Elsa has asked for people to uh, give their views as well as, as asking questions. So you might want to think about that. Um, you can put things in the chat for us to call on you. Um, you can also use the raise hand option, or if all else fails, uh, flutter your hand and, and unmute yourself and uh, we'll try to call on you. So um, those are the, the rules and please leave your mics off um, otherwise during the discussion. And I'm going to turn this over to Nancy Johns who will um, reintroduce Elsa. Nancy. It is such a pleasure to introduce my friend and former colleague, Elsa, Dr. Elsa Tamez. Elsa was born in Mexico, lived much of her professional life in Costa Rica, where I met her over 20 years ago. She is now semi-retired and living in Colombia and comes to us this morning via Zoom all the way across the waters. Our initial plan was to have Elsa here these two weeks as a resident, a theologian in residence. And um, there was a pandemic that arrived that changed our plans. But Tom, being the wise soul that he is, uh, said, well, why don't we Zoom her in? And so thus the adult education, uh, because she was scheduled to speak anyway. Um, and when, about two years ago, how I got back in touch with Elsa was, um, Two years ago, our co-pastor, Beth Neal, quoted Dr. Tamez in her sermon. I had an immediate visceral reaction to hearing Elsa's name. My recollection took me back many years to Costa Rica. I must admit that I was unable to refocus on what Beth was saying as I was overcome with warm remembrances, feelings, and vivid memories of the close relationship I had the privilege of having with Elsa. The year was 1975. I had flown into San Jose, Costa Rica from the US. I arrived with my bag at the old, worn out, termite infested building of the Latin America Biblical Seminary in downtown San Jose. I see you laughing, Elsa. Elsa had been elected the first woman, Heitor, president of the seminary's 72-year history. Can you imagine? It's about as bad as some of us here in the North, North America. I was directed to the assembly hall where Elsa was delivering her inaugural address. I was late and Elsa was well into her address to a large gathering. She reminded us that years before the seminary had purchased a large plot of ground right outside the city limits in San Jose, then city limits. This was done in an anticipation that one day enough money could be raised to build a more appropriate home for the seminary. Elsa announced that evening that she felt the time had come to do just that, and she had a dream of how to do it. Being the biblical scholar that she is, she pointed out that so many women in the Bible were nameless, such as the bent over woman, Lot's wife, and her dream was that finally women would have names. The seeds of a worldwide fundraising campaign were planted. Her idea was that individuals would donate $1 or the equivalent for each woman's name they wish to honor, living or dead. Elsa's many friendships and connections with the ecumenical group of women from various parts of the world who were living in San Jose were invited to form an organizing committee. We set up the framework for 
to fulfill Elsa's dream. The campaign was to be called One Million Women Building Our Dream. And build our dream we did. Some of you here might have participated in that campaign in your local congregation. It would be fun to hear from you after we get off of Zoom. It took a couple of years, but million, a million dollars was raised and a whole new campus was built on that plot of land and now houses the Latin America Biblical University. Dr. Elsa Thomas is an internationally respected biblical scholar and theologian. And as I mentioned earlier, she served as the first female president of the Latin America Biblical University. It was under her leadership that this institution from seminary became a university and got university status. Elsa has taught at various schools throughout the world. She received her master's degree from Latin America Biblical Seminary and the National University of Costa Rica. Her doctorate degree in theology is from the University of Lucerne, Switzerland. Her many published works, books, and journal articles have been translated into so many different languages. And these are all listed online under Elsa's name. We have a few of the copies in our own library at the church. I encourage you to take a look at that list online after today's class. Much more could be said about Elsa, but we are present today not to hear me talk about her, but to listen to her. So dear friend, colleague, and sister in faith, Dr. Elsa Thomas, bienvenido, welcome. Well, that was quite an introduction, Nancy. I think Elsa's gone into hiding. <laughs> I will see if she tries to hop back on. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, internet thing came. There is really a problem, I hope that that we, while, while I speak, the internet contain it. Uh, okay. Well, we have your text so people can read. Okay. Um, do I start? Yes, please. Okay. Well, thank you, Nancy, for these wonderful memories. I never forget them. So, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Let's start our study on James. Well, last Sunday, we discussed the biblical criteria offered by the letter of James for us to live as true Christians during a pandemic such as COVID-19. We remembered the suffering of the people in the communities to whom James writes, and we examined their internal problems as well. James encouraged hope and counseled the community to live the wholeness of their lives as fully integrated Christians. We talked about solidarity, tongue control, being mindful of what we say, and also we talk about greed. In this presentation, I will focus on one of the little studied guidance from James patience. This is an especially important virtue to consider in difficult times, such as suffering, oppression, persecution, death, or the pandemic, as in our case. Patience, as a virtue, has been misunderstood. Most of the time, it is considered a passive attitude or resignation. We imagine a person sitting cross-armed, accepting the situation with resignation, as if, as if to say, this is the way I should live. Nothing can be done. It is God wills, God's will, and...
looks like a brief introduction here. Elsa said that that she was having some trouble with her internet, so we'll we'll be patient here. <clears throat> After all, this whole talk is about patience, so <laughs> we'll have to practice that. Oh my goodness. So Elsa. Uh, uh, I see her. <laughs> okay, yes, I was looking in my in my, my paper, but uh, this is yours here and I can see it. We're all practicing um, patience, Elsa. Oh, this is sorry very much that this has happened. No, no problem. Oh my goodness, I can see my paper. Yeah. Okay, now um, I am in this second passage, and the following verses, ele uh, ten to eleven, we find two words James uses for patient. Of uh, or this verb, be patient, have patience. As an example of suffering and patience, beloved, take the prophet who spoke in the name of the Lord. Indeed, we call blessed those who showed endurance. You have heard of the, of the endurance of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. As we can see, in James, we find two Greek terms that are used for patience. To be patience, one of them is ipomone, patience, or its verb ipomoneo, have patience. And the other is macrothemia, patience, or the verb macrothemeo, be patience. The word ipomone is used in situation of extreme suffering where there is no way out. It occurs in books or passages of apocalyptic genre. In this text, those who suffer only expect God's intervention. There is neither the, uh, the strength nor the possibility to change the situation of the suffering they are experiences, experiencing. The meaning of the word does not imply that those who suffer wait with resignation for suffering to the end. The term implies having the ability to endure the situation and stand firm during suffering. Patience here means not to be crushed, but to preserve and to be constant. There is a certain degree of faith behind it that says that this situation will change at some point, that faith, even if there is no indication to verify the end of that bad situation, does make it possible to persevere. It has nothing to do with <laughs> passive resignation. This is why several translations of the Bible, such as the NRSB, do not translate patience, but perseverance into suffering. The other term, macrothemia, also means patience, nor uh, does it mean, nor is the, is the meaning of the word passive resignation or sit it with, uh, with arms crossed. However, it is a patience with connotations different from the term hypomony and its derivatives. James' example of the peasant 
who sows his seeds and passionately waits for them to bear a fruit illustrates precisely the meaning of patience. First, the peasant sows his seeds, sows his seeds, and must wait. The little tree or plant has its own timing and grow rate. Therefore, people must wait patiently for it to grow. There is no alternative but to wait patiently. It follows that the patience points to the meaning of not despairing or being, pa or being uh, patient. James invites us to act wisely without longing, being, being anxious or in despair, knowing with certainty that the fruit of the tree will be harvested in the future uh, helps. Knowing this certainty, helps uh, give us reason to not despair. There is no passivity in this patience. Rather, it has to do with a high active attitude. To have a good fruit, the person has to take care of the plant or the little tree. He must prune, water, protect from pred predators, and be aware of nutrients, etc. This activity requires a lot of patience. That is, the peasant must wait patiently for the result of his work. The glimpse of the end of a good harvest is well, it looks like Elsa's um, having some problems again. It's interesting to think about these two um, aspects of patience. I've been thinking about this quite a bit. I like the idea that it's not passive. Yes. Yeah, I think that's I think that, and I, you, you can see it's frustrating, as frustrating as it is, we are learning things uh, through the pandemic that we haven't been able to do before. Um, thinking about different ways of doing school and work and that requires a more active, uh, a, mac, a more active role. Continue. Uh, that's good. <laughs> You're almost there, know. Elsa. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> we were just talking about about patience and and the active oh, okay. part. Okay. So. <laughs> but please uh, let me ask my people don't to use the the, the, the internet. Let... Oh. <laughs> Sounds like a bandwidth issue. <laughs> Oh my goodness. <laughs> so, are you there? No. Yeah, so this is where we stopped. Okay, let also start with James 1 to 4. How difficult it is to understand that James tells his recipients that when they are going through hard trials, they need to consider themselves in a blissful state. I have a hard time telling someone who is suffering that she or he is needs, uh, he is needs to be blissful at such a time. Why is that the author says that, that to his recipients? I believe that this is an in advance or anticipated joke because James wants to convince them that suffering will be for the better when the difficult times are over. We could say that it is a call to stop for a moment and reflect. I believe that James has two reasons. On the one hand, he thinks that their faith tested 
purified, make them more solid, authentic, mature. And on the other hand, people learn to endure suffering with the strength, with heroic patience. And in doing so, they are strengthened. The author describes it as a process in which unwearing firmness of that heroic patience must not decay, but endure until the end in a way that people can, in the end, fly like the phoenix, that mythical bird that is reborn from the ashes. The process produces the effect full of feelings. It makes people mature and whole. Let us remember that James addresses people who are going through severe difficulties outside Palestine. And therefore his first speech in his letter start with an exhortation about patience in the sense of not being broken by this situation. The author encourages his addresses to see that if they are aware of suffering as a process, every day, everything will come out for the better. In other words, the author needs to encourage them during their difficulties. It makes them see the bright side of going through the test. He does not suggest that they enjoy the pain itself, not masochist, because his words are of pure comfort. What he wants is that they do not be crushed, but that they endure to the end, knowing that the trials are not eternal. Those who go through this moment moments should experience them as a process in which they will eventually emerge wiser and stronger. This is how we must endure this pandemic. People who are suffering greatly because of the death of their loved ones, for the loss of their work or property, have this James advice. Reflect on the process. Do not be crushed during the process and think with hope that in the end everything will work out because God does not forget them. As James says in, in 5.11, God is compassionate. Now let us look at the second passage. Uh, in uh, James 5.7-11, be patient then brothers and sisters until the lord's coming see how the farmer waits for the land to yield the, the value valuable crop patiently waiting for the autumn and the spring rains you too be patient and stand firm because the lord coming is near beloved do not grumble against one another so that you may not be judged see the judge is standing at the doors as an example of suffering and patience Beloved, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Indeed, we call blessed those who showed endurance. You have heard of the endurance of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. In these verses, James invites his recipients to imitate three characters, a peasant, the prophet, uh, prophets, and Job. In verse 7 and 8, he sets a peasant as an example. As we read, he plants trees, but he cannot do anything to grow his trees or plants, or for the rain to come. He must wait patiently for nature to do its part. Despairing is useless, because the situation is not going to change for now. How does the person achieve that patient? The text says that this. It is certain that at some point, when the planting process is over, it will achieve the expected fruit. It is that fruit that harvests, that harvest, that he visualizes, that him strongly. But he knows that for his fruit to be good, he cannot abandon his little plant or tree. He must be attentive 
work, work hard, taking care of his trees or plants and watching for predators. So the recipients of the letter are invited to imitate the peasant as they go through those painful difficulties they are experiencing. How can they succeed by being patient and not despairing? What will be the fruit that they will glean so that they do not faint? Here the author mentioned to the mentions that the Lord come, comes three times and is near. In verse seven, he says, be patient until the Lord's coming. In eight, be patient and stand firm because the Lord is near. And, and, and in nine, do not go by complaining to the judge for the judge is at the gates. See, the judge is standing at the bars. So what gives them strength is the Lord. His arrival marks the end of suffering. Uh, that is why it is not used to continue to despair or complain. It is better to focus on mutual care or maintaining self-control in both actions and words. It is a call to resist with courage, to be patient, being certain that it's all going to be over soon. The second example the author invites us to imitate is that of the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. They did not despair. In the midst of suffering, they were called blissful because they persevered, they endured until the end. What did they put up with? Persecution, torture, death. Not how in the case of the prophets, uh, we have these two concepts of passions. It's interesting. Not to despair and to endure or per persevere with courage. Um, the last example to imitate is Job's patience. And it is striking that James said Job as an example for patience because the biblical Job has no patience. In Job 3.1, we read, and this Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. Job said, let the day perish in which I was born and the night that said, a man child is conceived. Then Job began arguing with his friends and with God. What about, uh, about his unjust suffering. He speaks of, with a lot of belligerence, almost anger. He was just and he suffers unjustly. The righteous, according to the Jewish tradition of retribution, does not suffer, only the wicked. That is why Job protests vehemently. How can we understand this as an example to imitate? I think that there are two reasons. Job in Judaism and in our midst is a character known as a someone who had a lot of passions. But this job, this, this kind of Job appears only in the prologue of the canon, canonical book. That is only in the first two chapters when his wife says, curse God and die. And he answers her, you speak as a as any foolish woman will speak. Shall we receive the good at the hand of God and not receive the bad? And the, the narrator of the book says, in all this Job did not sin with his lips. But as far as the Job of passive patience goes, in chapter three, he begins by cursing the day he was born. So this protesting job is that of the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. The other reason, apart from the prologue to Job's canonical book, is the fact that according to some commentaries in the letter, it seems that James has in mind the Job of a Jewish extra canonical book called the Testament of Job. That is an exhortation to the patience and perseverance in difficult times. But uh, in any case, no, the commentary discussed 
what kind of job was James thinking about. In any case, James invites his reader to imitate Job's patience. Patience as perseverance, the stamina he has, and the fact that he did not let uh, himself be broken despite all the evils he suffered. The death of his whole family, the loss of, of all his property, the terrible skin and infections, in the betrayal of his friends, Eliphaz, and so far. Job, Job did not let himself die. And even though he had very, oh my God. Okay. Or the job who puts up a ver. Job did not let himself die. Not and even though he had very little hope, he did not give up in the face of adversity. What he wanted was for God to explain to him why his need for this unjust suffering. James invites Job to be imitated. Which Job should his recipients imitate? The canonical Job, the one who claims and protests, or the Job who puts up with it all without taking back, or a Job that resists and waits for a change? Actually, we don't know which Job James is thinking about. But if we follow the guidelines given to us by the author through the two terms for patience he uses, we will say that we have the right to imitate the biblical Job also. That is the fact that we are going through many difficulties does not forbid us to protest and ask God why he allows these things to happen to so many innocent people. This claim is part of the experience of life. It is, as, it is an emotional thing that must come out of the heart to feel relief. We can claim not only God, but governments that, uh, but governments that for example, manipulate quarantine for the political or economic benefit. Kim says, faith is the reason to endure suffering with the assurance that in the end, God will reward the sufferer as he did with Job. And this is according to James, illustrate, uh, according to James, illustrates that God is merciful and compassionate. As you can see, in the three examples, the person, the prophets, and Job, the faith, the certainty that there will be a change is present. And it is essential in order not to feel faint or to give up. Now let us apply this invitation to patients or to be patient in our daily context, and especially to this situation now that humanity is experiencing this year of 2020 and the COVID-19 pandemic. We are quarantined in most countries around the, the world. Each country experiences the pandemic in a particular way, but every day there are more and more infected people in the world and more dead in all countries. Larger numbers in some countries and less in others. The most valuable are the uh, vulnerable are the elderly and those who have disease that complicate their health, like hypertension, diabetes, obesity, and so on. At the time of writing, we have almost seven months uh, writing this, this presentation. We have, we have almost seven months of quarantine, quarantine in Colombia with cure food in the evenings and weekends. The goals, in government policies are to prevent the contagious spread of the disease and flatten the upward curve of the infected and dead. 
Let me repeat what I said last week. This situation is very delicate due to quarantine. Many small and medium-sized businesses and even some large ones have gone bankrupt. School, schools, universities, churches, and gyms are closed. Unemployment is extremely high and continues to grow. People who live from day to day have no income and cannot get out. The despair of many grows every day. The government offers something for the poorest family, but well below real needs. And in addition, corruption has grown and domestic violence has also increased due to the mandatory lockdown, lockdown in homes. People can go out to buy food, food and medicine. Following many health protocols, including mandatory masks, we can only go out according to the last number of our, of our card. Last month we was day, we last month was one day a week only, when one person per family was allowed out to shop for necessities. Now we can go three days uh, a week, according even to odd number day, the uh, because the fines are extremely high if this protocol is broken. So the problem is really serious and uncertainty reigns. A call to patients may sound counterproductive if it is conceived as being resigned to the status quo and accepting all the suffering with arms of it. This type of patients can cause depression. But if we think of the concepts of patients in the letter of James, they can be valid. Looks like we have to be patient again. <laughs> I do like the exhortation to not despair. And I like it that we can uh, say we don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have to sit with our arms folded. <laughs> right. Jane called us to resist. Hey, Hi, Elsa. We can hear you now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we must have faith and believe that God is aware of God's creation and give us the strength to endure quarantine in all the difficulties it entails. James calls us to resist bad times. It may also be thought that quarantine can have a purpose, but we can stop for a moment and meditate in our lives. The lives of our families, friends, and the church, and above all, on the recreation of nature that is happening because humans are not hurting it with harmful gases, gases, uncontrolled filling, uh, mining, mining, mining metal extraction, and the large amount of garbage we throw, throw out away. This can make us think about the importance of lifestyle change that make us more human and supportive. James, um, no, patience, this kind of patience no, can lead us to perfection according to the terms of James or a complete maturity with new interhuman relationships and with nature, less selfish and more on understanding relationships. It is the right time to create a new humanity or normality post-COVID-19 lifestyle. In the same line, we can reread the second concept of patience that appears in James, is macrothemia, in the fact of this reality where we can do nothing to change, 
to change it because it is out of our hands. We must accept it and not fall into despair. We need to wait with wise patience until the vaccine is available or wait until all this is over. The call is don't be depressed, depressed. don't despair and take care of for yourself and others. The call is for mutual care. It is important to believe that things will change at some point, although we do not know when or how, because as Ecclesiastes chapter 3, 1 says, for everything that is a season and a time for every matter under heaven, a time for pandemic and a time to be free. With this in mind, in mind we can focus on being better people. Fathers, grand, grand, grandmother, grandpa, grandma, mother, children, uncles, new uh, nephews, neighbors, friends. We can work harder on what is at uh, our fingertips to improve in every way. It is important to see the situation we experience every day, uh, all day long as a challenge to be creative, to examine ourselves, and to be compassionate and supportive of the people who need it. This is a unique opportunity for many people. Whatever with Job's example, we can also resist by claiming our rights wisely. We have the right to let this content out of our heart when we see unjust abuses around us. Let us remember that under no circumstances, James, talks of a passive patience. Telling people to be patient and wait on the Lord, thinking of patience as resignation is irresponsible in the face of the pain of others. I am aware that for some it is easier than for others. Especially it is difficult for those who do not have the breath of every day because they have lost their job. We cannot tell these people to be patient in the sense of resignation. We need to give them hope and tell them not to despair, but to resist and persevere. For God has given others to share with them and to meet their needs. Because of this, we will succeed. It helps a lot to think that the situation is going to change at some point. But that for now, we must persevere and not fall into despair. Someone said three pearls, pearls of wisdom regarding crisis. And we can apply it to the current situation of the pandemic. One, every crisis has a way out. Two, every crisis has an expiration date. And three, from every crisis, Something is always, always learned. Knowing this soothes and strengthens the waiting attitude. I think this is as Mandela who says these three things. Two suggestions from James to achieve patience, wisdom and prayer. I want to finish this presentation with these two advices from James that help us to achieve these two kind of passions we talked about. These are wisdom and prayer. Acting wisely is important because we must discern at every moment how we should act and what to talk about or what not to talk about. It's a wisdom that is not of knowledge or abstract, but like faith. It is shown in concrete and everyday facts. For example, coronavirus is highly contagious. A small oversight, negligence, or outburst, or even whim can whip out someone, or someone owns life and that of someone in the family. Confinement forces us to act wisely and with self-control. We must be careful with we use with we use words because of stress or anger. We can say words that hurt, 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 make wounds 
that are difficult to heal. And as for prayer, it must be said that it is essential to be able to endure with heroic patience, all that we are experiencing. Feeling accompanied by God through prayer, give us strength and rest. James invites us to pray continually with faith. He sets as an example, the prophet Elijah. James says he was an ordinary person like any of us and his prayer was powerful. So let us therefore pray that this situation in the future, in the future consequences of this painful situation for many will end soon, actually started. And especially for the poor who will be poorer and the media class, middle class who will be poor. Let us pray that we may come out more human, strengthened, measured and free so that we can restart our lives in a more human and supportive style. In other words, that we may be true followers of Jesus. Let us be light and salt bring so much sadness and need. And at the same time, in the midst of so many desires to live and start a new day. So the um uh, so let's let's think about how in your situation in the United States, how you and your family, how you personally, how you are experience this situation. Thank you. Thank you, Elsa. Those were good words. Oh my goodness, sorry. You can see, you can see the appreciation. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Okay. Um, Let's see. Your mic is up. Your mic is uh, off. Tom, you're muted. Yes. I have this. I do it. I you, I can temporarily unmute by pressing the space bar, but I'm afraid my space bar is getting a little a little flaky. But <laughs> I'll permanently un there. <clears throat> well, I'll, I'll just speak for myself, um, unless there's someone else who I, I find the message to not despair because it's useless to do that. Really powerful. And I guess the other thing that I find is that we can learn something from we can learn something from the pandemic and from the constraints that we've had to <clears throat> to go through. I think particularly of that picture, Elsa, that you had of the uh, of the child uh, studying at her desk by computer because we have the same thing the same thing here. And while it's hard to uh, imagine our grandchildren doing that. Um, they're excited by it and they're learning. And so we've learned something, even though it's difficult from the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Oh, Margie. I just wanted to say that I think it's Antonio Welty. Anyway, they had their hands raised. They okay. They can unwelt them here. I'll uh, I'll unmute them. Whoops. Can you unmute yourself, the Welties? <laughs> Really? There, there you go. There you go. Elsa, I want to thank you personally. This is a very difficult time for me. Uh, my sister is not well, and uh, I don't think I will be able to see her before she goes to heaven. 
and I was in a very depressed uh, uh, state. I want to tell you that what I heard from you today spoke very directly to my heart and to my experience. And I thank you for it because I am in a very um, difficult time with another sister. So my life right now is all involved in um, a great opportunity to be patient, to do what I can, and to be content with what I not do because I can't, and somebody else is going to do it for me because my sister is not alone. Thank you. I cannot put it in any other words, but it helps me to give this uh, word of gratitude because it did change something inside my, my way and my, my uh, comprehension of what I'm going through and how to handle it. Thank you. Thank you. I think we, we are going to pray, all of us we are going to pray for you because yeah, pray are powerful and will give you strength and hope and, you know. Thank you. I know you, you will. I knew you will. I have another I, question that maybe has been discussed before and I missed it. <clears throat> it Elsa, is there any difference from an epidemic that is hope, you know, we can understand that is controlled by outside us. Maybe we have helped to produce it, but also the a difference between how we approach the problem of pain and suffering uh, from an epidemic condition to a war condition where we have produced that. Does yeah. that's, uh, that's, uh, uh, the Apostle James help us to understand the difference? Yeah, yeah. I think that in James we have different issues. Like, like um, I tried to say in last Sunday, I spoke about greed and corruption and all these theories we have here about the production of the pandemic to reduce population and so and so. And that's why. It's important also that we have Job patience, that this uh, canonical book of Job that protest also, you see? It's passion to endure that. Um, uh, I, I don't know if I understood really your question. If it was that, that you, ask me or what do we do when we see that this situation was produced by human means or well, we have a, we have so much pain and suffering uh, with the people that are in war you know fighting you are talking about war 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 that is yes. this organized by us yes and then when we as a christian look at the epidemic condition that is is controlled uh, more than that with us than us um i think kelly scott has a question kelly do you want to well it's just a comment and actually it's it's sort of a different topic but i totally loved your image of the phoenix arising i'm here at the coast and i drove down on highway 18 and through the area of the fire. And I'll tell you, you know, you can see the pictures on TV, but driving by this trailer park and all that's left are these little squares of ash and the house across the street, it's a foundation of ash. There is nothing left. And it just, you know, these people are probably living on social security and without any homeowners insurance. and. You know, I just, it, it, it grieves me. So Elsa, thank you for, for your words of James to kind of help 
move forward um, in our local crises and the global crisis. Yes, yes, yes. I know that Lewis was um, also had a comment. I try to interrupt. Yes, if you have a comment. I, I, I was struck yeah. right at the beginning of your paper, Elsa, and very appreciative of just introducing the concept that there's more than one meaning to the English word patience or be patient. <laughs> and uh, you gave two Greek ones, but even in, in English, as I, as I listened to you, I started writing down words all the way from wait with despair, to tolerate, to persevere, to wait, to await, to anticipate. And I can think of, in the current ep uh, pandemic, I can think of examples of each of those all along the way. Uh, yeah, at some point, there, there are people who we know who have become sick and died. And in a sense, we do just have to tolerate that and hope we learn something from it. But on the other end, we await or anticipate some of the miracles of modern life, such as assuming there's going to be a vaccine and medications that will emerge that will help treat this. And so the exercise of patience really is a wide ranging exercise. Yes, I agree with you. I agree with you, yes. And in James, is very clear. David Graff. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for, for your words, particularly emphasizing uh, patience as perseverance. Uh, when I was a young man, I spent three years in the Republic of Niger in West Africa, very poor country, one always listed at the bottom of the list of, uh, by the UN of countries that are struggling. Uh, their, one of their favorite proverbs among the people with whom I lived was that patience is the medicine of the world. And they also frequently would say, uh, call on God to give them patience. At the time, as a young, arrogant North American male, I, I tended to think that they were saying uh, resignation is what patience meant. But in fact, mm -hmm. I think they meant perseverance, and your words have helped me understand that even more. So thank you. You are welcome. Yeah. I see Louise's hand. Go ahead, Louise. I think Tom's um, admonition that we not despair is so important, especially in terms of how we project our views onto our children and grandchildren so that they pick up on our, um, our response to all of this. And um, Tom, I know you give our grandchildren hope by your not despairing. I see Reverend Andrea. I can't see your full last name, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, bueno verte Elsa de nuevo. I saw Elsa, was it about 20, 30 years ago at the International <laughs> Cathedra uh, from Centro Rembao in Mexico. Uh, I, I am so uh, blessed with what you shared and I think it called out two things for me. One was just the, the, the activity of patience, the activity of suffering, that those aren't just events. And I think you called out for me the cadence, the cadence of those two as they go back and forth. That's not just one continuum, but how, how we bounce back and forth in terms of our response to it. Uh, you have made me really think more about those initial moments and it still has is continued. And what is really essential? Essential in our caring for one another, our caring for ourselves, our needs, the needs of others. What is absolutely essential? So I know that I'm gonna to continue to embrace the gift of your wisdom. Y muchísimas gracias. Oh, muchas gracias a ti. Our, our time is, is up right now. And um, uh, I've, first of all, by the way, I'd like to thank uh, and notice that there are many people from outside the Westminster congregation that are here and I'm so glad that you are all able to join us and 
Elsa, thank you so much for your two classes. Um, we'll be thinking about this for, for a long time. And the fact that we can talk with you in Columbia is I think a, a, really a blessing. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you to you. It was very nice for me to share the word of God with all of you. Yeah. And I'll let the meeting run for a few more minutes, but I know that, that people need to get away so we can all just, um, just chat if there are some final words. I'd like to say something. And uh, also, you talked about how well nature is doing and having breather. If we, uh, if we think about our side, of course, children of God, and we are being nurtured in a way by this horrible situation for many people because it gives us the time to step away from it and actually look at the condition of the world and then to become the hands of God in helping other people. And we see around us all of nature, the trees, they're breathing, they're flowering. Of course, they're finished now because it's fall. But at the same time, we have those two examples that we are being nurtured by God through this and learning and growing as human beings and learning then how to take care of each other better, just as he gives us the example of nature. Thank you for that, that okay. view. Well, thank you. Thank you. Well, time is now getting late. We have to all uh, migrate to the worship service. So I'm going to thank Elsa once again and, um, and hope to see you all next week at, um, when we hear from uh, Dr. Sarah Gary about epidemiology. So, And please, bye-bye. As soon as you can, fly yeah. over the puddle and come to see us. Thank you, Nancy. <laughs> yeah.